The hallmark of a successful shooter game is the weapons provided to players. More than the player themselves, these fictional firearms are the main characters of the games we play, always on the screen, always protecting us in a pinch, and in some cases becoming the poster child for an era in online competition. CSGO has the AK-47, Gears of War has the Nasher, Halo? Well, Halo has the battle rifle. It's as iconic to Halo as it is to console esports. It's curved scope, 36 round digital ammo counter and bullpup frame has carried many competitive Halo teams to victory over the years. And in a series as long running as Halo, it stands to reason that there's many, many different takes on this highly memorable weapon. In this remastered episode of the evolution of Halo, let's all walk down memory lane and take a look at each incarnation of this weapon over the years. If you enjoyed this video, then give it a like, and hey, if you enjoyed the original, then spread this one around, seeing as much of the information here has been updated with behind-the-scenes trivia, developer insight, and much more. As usual, a thank you to the developers I spoke to about the Battle Rifle's production, and those in the community who know it like the back of their hand. With all the formalities out of the way, let's take a trip back to the early 2000s. Citizens of the world, we are in deep doo-doo. Halo Combat Evolved was a celebrated game. Its campaign packed a level of production value and presentation not seen in shooters at the time, and its split-screen component ensured that it became a go-to party game for groups and friends to take turns on in social gatherings. Its multiplayer even garnered a competitive scene, much like Smash Brothers for the Nintendo 64, taking the mechanics, sandbox, and gameplay of the game and playing it with a competitive mindset. The star weapon of Halo 1's competitive scene was the pistol a jack-of-all-trades utility weapon that acted as the primary weapon that all other guns had roles to function around. While the pistol's incredible power was certainly an accident of last-minute damage value tweaks, the idea inadvertently served the game's two-weapon limit. The pistol was the player's primary gun, useful in most situations and an extension of the player's will while reserving their secondary slot for one of the many, many useful gadgets and weapons that had properties and strengths not provided by the pistol, such as the long-range insta-kill sniper rifle, stun-locking plasma rifle, rapid melee attacking and high ammo count close-range assault rifle, and so on. There was a problem, though. Many saw it as downright silly that in a game with all manners of rifles, a pistol was the main weapon driving the sandbox. And so, when beginning work on the sequel, Jamie Griesmer, the godfather of Halo 1's groundbreaking control scheme and designer on many of the game's weapons, recalled immediately saving the tags for Halo 1's pistol as a battle rifle. This time around, Halo 2's primary weapon would have a design that actually fit the role, a multi-purpose, jack-of-all-traits rifle weapon, with the former game's assault rifle now being reborn in the form of the more thematically fitting SMG. To understand the battle rifle, let's talk about social and competitive Halo. Halo 2's social multiplayer was designed with all players beginning with a close quarters, fully automatic weapon. Due to the rate of fire, ease of use, and spraying nature of such a weapon, the limited range ensured that players had room to breathe, move about the maps, and keep the matches feeling social, relaxed, and enjoyable. The SMG couldn't get everything done on its own, which encouraged players to get outside of their comfort zone a bit practice melee attacks after exhausting a magazine into an enemy player's shields or using some well-placed grenades. Eventually, the player would notice weapons laying about the various multiplayer maps, upgrades for their arsenal, encouraging them to search for better tools with better range properties and functionalities, kicking off ranged, skilled gunfights as players bobbed and weaved between predictable bursts before a death would reset them back to SMG starts, kickstarting the process all over again. This was the flow of Social Slayer. It was a great way to keep matches feeling fair, social, and fun while rewarding those who upgraded themselves and moved beyond their starter weapon. For competitive ranked play, however, players knew what they were doing. They were here to win. This is where the battle rifle came in. From the offset, all players were given the battle rifle, eliminating that initial hunt for a better weapon and allowing the skilled gunfights to be the main focus of ranked play. The Battle Rifle was a three-round burst weapon, giving it a level of precision and range while ensuring that this precision and range was kept in check via an identifiable firing pattern. 
The model itself was created by Robert McLeese, building off the first game's assault rifle and establishing a design trend of human rifles in the Halo universe being bullpup. While this was definitely a product of the late 90s and early 2000s speculation that bullpup weapons were the gun of the future, it just adds a layer of charm to Halo's universe, that this was the standard for most rifles. It helps Halo's design language stand out from other shooters, and it's a design choice that's only aged like a fine wine. With a healthy 36 rounds per magazine, a round scope affixed to the top, and a nice round charging bolt on the side of the rifle, the frame of the battle rifle stood out in combat and led the charge in the game's multiplayer. The presentation for the weapon was quite strong as well, with a healthy layer of smoke that drifted away from the barrel upon each burst. The gun also had some pretty solid melee animations, which were stripped down from Halo 2's cancelled melee combo system. And while the reload animations may not be as expressive or polished as its E3 animations or even the assault rifles animations from the previous game, the battle rifle still felt snappy, reliable, and responsive in players' hands. It's the main weapon of the Master Chief in the game's campaign, a weapon that most players would hold on to. Interestingly, prior to release, Bungie did tinker with different firing modes for the battle rifle. Eventually, this was dialed back into a simple burst mode for the final release, and Vengeful Vadim, one of the Halo community's best modders and archivists, theorized that Bungie may have just done this to simplify the weapon and make it more straightforward to use. What was truly remarkable about the battle rifle, though, in the final release was the discovery of what the community called button combos. Halo 2 was quite an unpolished game as a side effect of its development cycle, and one of the many exploits players discovered were ways to utilize the melee and reload canceling systems to pull off insta-kill moves, such as meleeing, canceling the animation, and then finishing with a burst to the head. This was called the BXR due to the button inputs needed, but many more were created by the competitive community. These button combos created an unintentional skill gap that while well celebrated by the competitive community due to the way it essentially brought fighting game button combo mechanics to a gunfight, was disliked by the social community as well as developers for how harmful this was in social settings. Halo 2's larger sandbox also noticeably struggled with giving players weapons with larger purposes. Many weapons like the plasma rifle, brute plasma rifle, needler, and pistol struggled to stand on their own outside of the dual wielding system which locked players players out of their grenades and melee attacks, leaving really only the battle rifle, snipers, rockets, and swords feeling meaningful or really fleshed out. Now, this doesn't keep the battle rifle itself from being an iconic symbol for console esports. Listen to the sound of its burst, and let the sounds really fill your eardrums. These bursts were the rallying cry of a powerful competitive scene in the mid-2000s, and this burst still sounds strong. In 2007, Halo 3 released for the Xbox 360, the at the time latest generation of Xbox consoles. The power afforded by the new console allowed Bungie to flesh out Halo's universe and worlds with advanced lighting techniques, significantly larger play spaces with more AI at any given time, and of course, high quality materials, shaders, and simulation systems to make the battlegrounds of Halo 3 feel more alive and reactive than any game before. Not only did the battle rifle make a triumphant return, its assault rifle brother also returned to the fold, filling the role of the close-range social starter weapon the players would upgrade from over the course of their matches, with the next-gen battle rifle acting as the new face of competitive and ranked play. Halo 3's battle rifle is remarkably similar to Halo 2's, just featuring more detail such as the cool little lights Halo 3 places on its UNSC gear to give it a subtle, techy look while breaking up the monotony of the militaristic black and grey metals. It's an excellent combination of color, material, and design that makes the Halo 3 battle rifle feel charismatic. But what's more charismatic are the new animations the battle rifle cleverly borrows from the assault rifle. It's definitely a way to save on resources and time, but I always loved the animation continuity between the UNSC's bullpup rifles that started here in Halo 3 and was carried up to Halo 4. The reload animation itself is broken into three parts, magazine out, magazine in, bolt charged. There isn't much to it, but what makes it work is how simple but readable it is, both in and out of combat. The hand makes sure to strike clear action poses, which makes the animation feel almost comic book panel-y in how readable it is, without a big meaty Spartan fist taking up your screen and obscuring the action. It's a solid, almost timeless set of animations, minus one rather humorous oversight on the melee animation. 
The safety catch briefly gets detached from the gun before safely floating back into place once the melee animation finishes. It still bothers me to this day, and it's mostly a side effect of the weapon borrowing the assault rifle's animation set, and it's your pain too now if this kind of stuff bothers you like it does me. It's got a great set of animations, a great design. How is it mechanically? Well, the Halo 3 battle rifle was a brilliant idea with an execution that tripped itself up a bit. For the sake of simplicity, I'm not going to be discussing if Halo 2 technically under the hood used hitscan because functionally, the game's ballistic weapons were just hitscan. They instantly harmed targets with little to no delay upon a trigger pull, and in order to not bore you to tears, let's just say Halo 2 used hitscan. And for all of Halo 2's competitive strengths, this was a rather overly generous system that tended to allow weapons such as the battle rifle to unintentionally overperform. Halo 3's weapons adopt a much more skill-oriented projectile system that sees shots take a fraction of a second or two before impacting their target. This, in theory, leads to a more relaxed social experience due to the weapons being less overly rewarding while also demanding more skill from players who engage their weapons at long range. Players would need to leave their shots and make adjustments accordingly to hit distant targets, essentially self-balancing the sandbox at range. It's a great idea, but the issue was an infamously rough netcode that was created for Halo 3. Halo 3's netcode would overly prioritize and focus on things like the placement of physics objects, grenades, ragdolls, etc., and it would quite often deprioritize the projectiles you just fired, leading to many blank shots that simply dealt no damage. Couple this issue with the low tick rate of the Xbox 360 60 servers, and it led to a belief that on the Xbox 360, the battle rifle was a downgrade from Halo 2's. In local split-screen and campaign, the intention of the battle rifle could shine stronger. It definitely felt more consistent. But this hardly made up for other minor criticisms competitive players had, such as the randomized bullet spread. It was a weapon that meant well, but sadly lacked the polish and infrastructure to support what it wanted to do. But within the sandbox of Halo 3, it did its duty to the best of its abilities. Modes such as Big Team Battle benefited quite strongly from the projectile system self-balancing the weapon. That being said, it is hard to master, fall back on, and rely on a weapon that could, at the drop of a hat, deal no damage when the servers turned against you. And with the shutting down of the Xbox 360's Halo 3 servers, the original Xbox 360 Halo 3 Battle Rifle is a relic lost to time. It's a weapon that's legacy has been rewritten by the MCC version of Halo 3 that featured a few quirks and oddities of their own that we'll get to. But here in 2007, it was a bitter send-off for a weapon that was so iconic, and it's a weapon that would go missing in action until 2012. For the better part of half a decade, Halo's iconic battle rifle had virtually no major appearances. It did make a small cameo appearance in one of Halo 3 ODST's cutscenes, but it was fully MIA in Halo Reach outside of concept art explorations. So, to many players' sadness, they wouldn't be able to find this weapon safely in a cave on Reach eating beans like they would Noble Six. But behind the scenes, a new take on the Halo series was in the works. 343 Industries' first ever major Halo title, a sequel to Halo 3. Halo 4 was envisioned as a soft reboot for the Halo brand, with a new direction for its art, music, tone, and gameplay. There was a desire early on to return many of Halo's long-absent weapons to their former glory, such as the SMG. Many of Halo's iconic weapons didn't actually make the cut, except for a few of the important ones, namely a very specific one. Near the end of the game's opening level, the player would spacewalk along the outer hull of the UNSC Ford unto dawn, and upon leaving the airlock, they'd be greeted by an old friend with a new makeover. The battle rifle of Halo 4 is an incredibly detailed gun for the Xbox 360's hardware, making extremely good use of texture work, bump maps, and specularity to fake depth that the Xbox 360 couldn't actually render. The color of the body was considerably brighter and more vibrant, with dark grays swapped out for an almost silver coloration. An orange band goes down the framework of the gun to break up the colors, and the ammo counter was changed from a black screen with cyan numbers to a glowing teal display with black numbers, essentially inverting the old ammo counter's colors to complement the new, brighter color scheme of the weapon. 
Almost all rounded elements were squared up, giving it a more industrial and blocky look. Even the memorable rounded scope was turned into a holographic style square sight to complement the new frame. The animations, now being different from the assault rifles, were still animated in the spirit of the assault rifles and now DMRs, continuing the animation continuity between the various UNSC rifles to great effect. Like most sounds in Halo 4, the audio identity of the weapon was revamped. The bursts are far more scratchy and compressed than past battle rifles, and increase in pitch as the ammo gets drier. It's a sound that can be a bit grating if sharp sounds bother you, but there are those who appreciate the mechanical depth of each burst. It was a new look, style, and feel for the battle rifle of Halo. Not exactly the HD makeover many were expecting 343 to go for, but instead a new spin, maintaining the silhouette somewhat while replacing all the details, giving the Reclaimer Saga a battle rifle that fit its new artistic direction. It's a damn solid design for a weapon, even if it's a bit different from Halo's usual design language. How is it in gameplay? Well, one of the core tenets of Halo 4 was to aggressively appeal to modern gaming trends and expand Halo's reach further than prior Bungie games. Rather than designing for the typical primary slash secondary Halo formula with a central keystone weapon that other weapons function and were balanced around, weapons in Halo 4 were treated more like Call of Duty weapons to fit the game's new loadout system. The battle rifle was now no longer a weapon designed to be the primary weapon of the game's competitive core. Instead, it was more along the lines of an M16 in Call of Duty 4 or Modern Warfare 2, something you chose based on preference rather than its role in the sandbox. The game's Call of Duty-inspired loadout system even included many of the COD series' signature perks, such as sleight of hand to help speed up the BR's reload or toughness to reduce flinch. And on that note, 343 also removed the D-scope mechanic and introduced a flinch system to make ranged combat far easier for players. The weapon's faster-than-normal fire rate and returning hit scan model made it quite easy to land most if not all shots and when coupled with an aggressive bullet curve and magnetism that at times can let you land headshots without actually hitting the head, it led to Halo 4's battle rifle being one of the least skillful, most overly rewarding weapons in the series. A weapon that holds the player's hands rather than tests their abilities. A way to just run around and get killing sprees, rather than drive the series' successful social versus ranked formula. Coupled with the DMR, Covenant Carbine, and Newcomer Light Rifle all fighting for essentially the same role in combat, nothing was remarkable about the game's combat loop or the battle rifle's role in it. What fire rate do you want the gun to be? And that was essentially it. Once you got bored, there was nothing deeper to explore because the weapon had no deeper skill curve. No projectile shots to get better at leading, no button combos to master and refine. Halo 4's multiplayer died a sad death. A balancing patch did slow the fire rate of the battle rifle and upped its damage slightly for the game's multiplayer, and versions of Slayer were eventually made available that removed the loadout and killstreak system. But this didn't improve the game much, since the core sandbox was still designed with that Call of Duty mindset in mind. There just wasn't much depth here. It's hard to say if the new developer's vision of Call of Duty-ifying Halo was the reason Halo 4 died the way it did, or if the game's fun but far too quick progression system bored players. But one thing is for sure, this was the battle rifle at its most unremarkable and lowest point one it would need to escape from in the future. In 2014, 343 published the Master Chief Collection, a massive collection of Halo's mainline entries for the Xbox One. The various games on the collection were outsourced to studios such as Certain Affinity, Saber Interactive, and so on. The collection contains a remaster of Halo 2's campaign to celebrate the 10-year anniversary of the iconic shooter, and of course, the weapon that spearheaded that era the Battle Rifle. Built off Daniel Kuksov's concept art, the Halo 2 Anniversary Battle Rifle is a work of art, lovingly recreating the weapon and providing it many of the details that could only be implied through texture work on the original Xbox hardware, with a few creative changes that deviated from the original. The charging handle was swapped out with something a bit more practical, if a bit generic, and the scope's lens was changed from a deep navy blue to a bright cyan-like color. Its sounds were also remastered, staying true to the identity of the weapon while giving it the fidelity of a real firearm. It's an excellent remaster of the original weapon that pays tribute to what came before. For the multiplayer, 
Halo 2 Anniversary actually uses the Halo 4 game engine, and with that comes a few oddities. The same model was used, albeit with a few darker textures, and due to the way that the Halo 4 engine handled reflectiveness and lighting, the Halo 2 Anniversary multiplayer battle rifle appears far lower in quality and almost like there's a layer of rubber that was applied over the weapon. It's a step down from the campaign incarnation, save for one detail. The scope's lens in Halo 2 Anniversary Multiplayer is the correct color. This version of the battle rifle also unfortunately suffers from a bug that happens quite frequently in Halo 2 Anniversary Multiplayer, where certain sounds just won't play when the engine is under stress, like reloading a weapon or switching to it, which can irritate you if this kind of stuff bugs you in games. Reverting. It may look and occasionally sound like the Halo 2 battle rifle when the audio isn't bugging out, but this was the Halo 4 engine under the hood. Mechanically, it had more in common with its Halo 4 counterpart than the original Halo 2 counterpart. Now, unlike Halo 4, Halo 2 Anniversary's multiplayer didn't use loadouts and made choices to gear the combat loop more towards the traditional Halo formula. But due to the overly forgiving nature of Halo 4's game engine and the ease of use of the Halo 2 Anniversary multiplayer BR, it tends to again, hold the player's hand more than it does accurately call back to the competitive button combo juggernaut of old. That being said, Halo 2 Anniversary rather interestingly provided players with what 343 tried to do in Halo 4, a more casual, accessible take on the Halo formula. And it did it to great success by embracing rather than abandoning Halo's core design tenets. If you're ever tired of the sweatiness of ranked play in other Halo titles, Halo 2 Anniversary can give you a relaxed experience that does still feel like Halo. And for those who do enjoy Halo 2 Anniversary, the battle rifle is an easy-to-use weapon that rarely fails. But for some who wanted more, the next game in the mainline Halo series would be the biggest shakeup to the Halo formula since Halo 4. The launch of the Xbox One marked a fresh opportunity for 343. The divisive reception of Halo 4 was taken in stride by the developers, and they prepared themselves for the next generation of hardware by focusing on the core criticisms of Halo 4, mainly the lack of a competitive focus as well as the lack of even starts. There was still very much a strong desire to continue pushing the series more towards the style of shooters found in the likes of Call of Duty, but perhaps this could be done without directly copying many of the overt systems such as killstreaks, perks, and loadouts. New hirees such as Quindel Hoyo, who is hot off the Gears of War Judgment Train, as well as those such as Chris King, Josh Holmes, Ryan Darcy, Tim Longo, and so on, envisioned a new formula for Halo's gameplay in Sandbox. Off the bat, all weapons would be easy to pick up and easier to use at most desired ranges thanks to the tighter spread, increased range, and the removal of the classic scope system and introduction of a first for Halo. Aiming down the sights, all weapons could now be the stars of the show, from the lowliest plasma pistol to the mightiest sniper rifle. The skill gap would be carried this time around, not by the weapons, but by the player's new enhanced mobility mechanics. No longer missing jumps thanks to clamber, strafing with more ease thanks to a quick button press to activate thrust, running laps around the map with Halo's fastest ever sprint, or keeping the pressure up with other abilities such as slide, charging, ground pound, and so on. Halo 5 was a new kind of shooter, one quite different from the traditional Halo formula, but high energy enough to appeal to those who enjoyed enhanced mobility shooters, those who thrive and reactionary games rather than slower-paced, sandbox-driven games. And with this new gameplay direction came the new incarnation of Halo's iconic competitive weapon. The battle rifle of Halo 5 Guardians is a beautiful, beautiful work of art. Building off the design established in Halo 4 and making adjustments and modifications to the color scheme to make it less garish and more aggressive looking. During production, the ammo counter was switched from cyan to a deep orange color, complementing the weapon's new colors and accents nicely, and its iconic scope was switched out for a more standard first-person shooter red dot sight, most likely to separate it from the DMR, which was also returning, as well as honestly putting an emphasis on the new aiming down the sights mechanic. For the final release, the deep orange ammo counter was unfortunately brightened up a bit and turned into a yellow color, which I don't think looks nearly as cool as the deep orange, but yeah, that's just personal preference. Its sounds were also thankfully overhauled to be more pleasant to the ears, and its new animations, oh, these were a treat. 
The DMR's animations diverged from the standardized animation style for Halo's bullpup weapons, in my opinion to disastrous results, we'll get to that in another video, but for the battle rifle and assault rifle, these were some of the best, most charismatic takes on that standard bullpup reload style that was started in Halo 3. Nice. Unfortunately, Halo 5's battle rifle just didn't shine within the game's combat dance. Due to the game's abundance of weapons all filling more or less the same easy-to-use longer-range combat roles of varying fire rates, the battle rifle was just a single ranged weapon in a sea of ranged weapons that all did the same thing, and in some cases, better than the good old BR. In the campaign, the battle rifle is the weapon you start off with in all missions where you play as the new character Spartan Locke, and unfortunately due to the campaign's focus on ranged combat and overwhelming number of enemies, the missions often felt more like Call of Duty style shooting galleries than proper Halo campaign levels, with the combat loop discouraging getting close to enemies and the external sandbox not really offering much beyond what fire rate would you like? The battle rifle just didn't really stick the landing in the campaign. The multiplayer version fared a bit better, but also not by much. Esports veterans recall specific leads at 343 ignoring feedback and forcing the new long-ranged assault rifle as Halo 5's new starter weapon for competitive play, which simply devolved the competitive experience into messy, patternless experiences with players spraying a sea of shots downrange with no patterned bursts to give a flow or any kind of structured ranged combat and even unintentionally sweating up social play, making for a less structured experience for all players. Even after the assault rifle was eventually, reluctantly, phased out of the HCS, the battle rifle never really found a voice, a problem actually made worse following a controversial balancing patch that lowered its rate of fire and introduced a vertical recoil pattern, leaving the door wide open for the Halo 5 Magnum to take the competitive crown due to its generous bullet magnetism, range, high magazine count, and time to kill. It's not all doom and gloom though, because in the game's Warzone mode, balancing was more or less a non-issue since players could spawn with whatever they wanted, and it even took things further than Halo 4's loadout system, allowing players to place attachments on their weapon. The battle rifle was a loadout weapon players could use and unlock attachments for, many of which did offer alternative uses for the gun. Let's go over them, shall we? The laser targeter is your standard first-person shooter laser sight attachment. It tightens up hip fire spread while also increasing bullet magnetism, especially around the head area. The long barrel does what it says on the tin. It extends the maximum range of the weapon, increasing its red reticle range and maximum and minimum damage ranges. It also provides range benefits to aim assist. The silencer attachment reduces the audio profile of the battle rifle, keeping the player off enemy radars when firing at the cost of a reduced effective range. The stabilizing jet is an attachment that essentially eliminates vertical recoil on weapons. This is very handy for weapons such as the battle rifle. The kinetic bolts attachment allows for greater damage and knockback against vehicles. It also disintegrates enemies upon landing a headshot kill. The energy blade attachment is reverse engineered covenant technology, allowing for an insta-kill energy bayonet on the end of your weapon. It even changes the melee animations too. The Night Blade attachment, on the other hand, is reverse engineered Forerunner technology, which allows for a hard light blade that can take down and knock back vehicles much faster. It's wise, though, to just avoid this attachment unless you want to get splattered by a charging ghost. The extended magazine attachment buffs the battle rifle's ammo count by a whopping 50% at the cost of not allowing for alternate scopes to be added. The threat marker highlights enemies upon damaging them, allowing you to track them through walls for a time. The only downside is, again, the inability to mix and match scopes. And finally, the sound dampener attachment, which extends the range of the weapon like a long barrel while reducing the sound profile like a suppressor. You can't mix and match scopes with this attachment, which makes it rarely used. And now it's time for the sights. The Recon Sight is your standard first-person shooter Red Dot Sight, and it comes on the battle rifle by default. The Long Shot Sight is the scope of a DMR placed on a battle rifle, allowing for longer-ranged engagements while aiming down the sights. The Sentinel Sight is a scope with two different zoom configurations. It's worth combining this attachment with the Stabilizing Jet for maximum effectiveness. The hybrid sight is the sight of a Halo 5 carbine attached to the battle rifle. It can't be combined with barrel attachments, so this one is mostly just down to personal preference. 
The Classic Sight is a recreation of the classic Bungie-era scope for the battle rifle, usable in Warzone and beloved by veterans. The Morph Sight is reverse-engineered forerunner technology. It may look cool, but it can't be combined with barrel attachments, so it's best to avoid this one. And finally, the Cog Sight, which highlights enemies in the scope's view and updates the player on their shield and health situation. Excellent for hunting AI targets. Now, now, if all these attachments and red dot sights have you daydreaming about the good old days, then have no fear, because 343 also gave legacy fans a bone by bringing the Halo 2 Anniversary Battle Rifle into Halo 5 as a legendary variant of the iconic weapon. The Halo 5 version of Halo 2's BR uses a more familiar sound profile, while also making good use of that Halo 2 Anniversary model. Its fire rate, bullet magnetism, and handling more closely mimic the original weapon, just without the button combos, and unfortunately, rather than port over the original animations to cap out this nostalgic throwback, original animations were created that are noticeably sloppier and less weighty than the ones found on the Halo 5 battle rifle. You can tell there's a difference in polish between the two weapons that does, at least to me, lead to the Halo 2 battle rifle feeling stiff and awkward when compared to its more excellently animated Halo 5 version. The sound profile of it was also bugged in the same balancing patch that adjusted the battle rifle's fire rate, now it'll occasionally sound muffled during gunfights. It's a bug that 343 never fixed, and it can still be occasionally experienced in the current build of the game. Without much mechanical diversity or reasons to use weapons outside of purely how good they are at killing, Halo 5 Sandbox quickly became a TTK arms race to find which weapon killed the fastest, and the Magnum was the clear victor. The battle rifle of Halo 5 is a reliable, if unremarkable, weapon in the game's more homogenized sandbox, standing out more for its fire rate than roll. It was a noticeable improvement over Halo 4's battle rifle in not just sound design, but even animation and color work. But further refinements would need to be done if the battle rifle was to dig itself out of the hole it made. For the last five years, the MCC has seen a steady stream of updates to improve the quality of the package with a fresh PC port, new customization options, improvements, and much more. For Halo 3, tweaks were made to the netcode and tick rate of the game in order to make the online experience more consistent and feel more up to par with the 60 frames per second and higher frame rate. Now, this didn't come without its side effects because there were a few under the hood changes to how hit detection felt. Some weapons began overperforming while other weapons began dramatically underperforming compared to the original 360 version of Halo 3, and one of the weapons to come out on top was the battle rifle. You still need to lead your shots, which is a layer of skill that wasn't taken away, but it's far more aggressive and consistent in its hits than other weapons affected by the netcode and tick rate changes, which often leads the Halo community to misremember how Halo 3 was supposed to feel in a similar vein to Halo Reach, which also saw changes in its MCC port that caused the DMR to overperform. On the plus side, however, Halo 3 on MCC did see a slew of non-native cosmetic options for players to dig into. As a start, most weapons now support a skin system which comes in a variety of unique, well-designed patterns. And if skins aren't to your liking, leaving the default skin on actually does still see a change because of new 2K textures and materials that were made for the Battle Rifle's base model that do show up in-game for your viewing pleasure even if you have no skins attached. And to make things better, the Battle Rifle was made available to players in Halo 3 ODST's Firefight mode, marking the first time outside of modding that this weapon was available in the cult classic Halo title. Halo 2 Anniversary also saw support for the new skin system, albeit without the 2K textures, and unfortunately the audio issues were never patched. But more customization options for the fan-favorite casual Halo game is, of course, appreciated. With 343 adding legacy and lost content to MCC, such as the infamous Halo 2 E3 demo. It's safe to say this isn't the end of MCC's journey, and it's been a pleasure to be a part of it. When pre-production began on the latest entry in the Halo series, 343's new sandbox lead sought to introduce a new slew of weapons to Halo, cutting a lot of the bloat that had built up over the years, but also unfortunately cutting many weapons that did serve important roles, not just functionally, but also nostalgically. It was a sandbox bloodbath. Nothing was safe. Despite the amount of weapons that didn't make the cut, such as the shotgun, plasma rifle, and fuel rod gun, many weapons were able to, thankfully, transition to Halo's new era. 
and among these weapons was the fan-favorite battle rifle, now called the BR-75. Despite the initial reveal trailer for Halo Infinite using the Halo 5 battle rifle as a placeholder, the final game's BR-75 is an incredibly high-quality update to the original design, drawing much inspiration from the Halo 2 Anniversary BR but with a few creative changes. The weapon's signature rounded scope now sits taller on the weapon, attached to a sight rail. The front-pronged barrel was swapped out with a new, more rounded barrel, and the ammo counter was made far darker than that of the assault rifle, while also changing the font that the numbers use to be less analog. The weapon sports manufacturer decals to give it a sense of history, and in general, it's incredible to see such a beautiful design in crisp 4K with modern rendering and material work. It's quite excellent and high quality, no doubt about that. What is a bit inconsistent, though, is its presentation. The audio design, on one hand, is fantastic, being far lower in tone than normal, but definitely not sounding bad. It sounds more like a deep rumble now with each burst than the higher crack 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 of the Bungie and Halo 5 battle rifles. Sadly, firing the gun does lack smoke effects, but this isn't an issue exclusive to the battle rifle in Halo Infinite. Now, the animation quality is pretty messy to be honest, appearing chunky, stiff, and less fluid than animations of the past. The animations for the battle rifle aren't bad by any means, but they have a pretty weak flow and pretty weak posing. The classic three-part reload has been broken up into a series of smaller moments, and each one happens just a bit too quick to get a clear read on the flow of the reload, so to speak, and it doesn't help that the oversized Spartan hands obscure most of the action during key moments. To me, at least, it's just sort of this stiff, ugly mess of hands moving about on the edge of the screen, and then suddenly it's ready to fire. It lost the spirit of the battle rifle's classic reload, and it's a step down in charisma and readability definitely from the Halo 5 battle rifle. But these are just my opinions on aesthetic things that don't really matter. How is it during gameplay? Well, 343 had a desire to get back to a more role-focused formula for balancing weapons, focusing more on weapons serving specific functions in combat. An element of Halo 4 and 5 that 343 did want to retain was the hit-scan nature of most weapons and ensuring that the guns were all easy to pick up and easy to use. What results is Halo Infinite's weapons being narrowly balanced around what the developers think the effective range should be. With Halo Infinite, the contradiction of all weapons need to be very easy to use and weapons need to be easy to use, but only in specific ranges, results in a balancing philosophy that means weapons are fairly unsatisfying to use until you hit this unseen range sweet spot. Then the gun suddenly becomes so easy to use that it's not really that challenging or skillful to secure the kill. The strafe speed of players in close range combined with the intentionally slow fire rate makes the infinite BR feel just unsatisfying in close quarters. Combat gets far too slippery, and players might as well just switch to the far easier assault rifle, ironically making their social starter weapon more valuable in a lot of engagements than the weapon players should be upgrading towards. But here's the thing, when that range sweet spot is hit, the battle rifle's generous aim assist values, even post-patch, and its self-correcting vertical recoil pattern means that aiming at the easiest target on an enemy, their center mass, rewards players with a free headshot since the weapon will bounce itself up to the head before resetting back to the chest for the player, essentially doing the hard work of micro-adjusting your aim for you. Aim at the chest, you'll be rewarded with a headshot, and then the weapon will correct its aim back down to the chest. It's a battle rifle that's deliberately handicapped in specific ranges because of how easy it is to use, and then it's far too easy to use once you get into the range that the developers want you to use it at, and it results in a battle rifle that just feels off. Like it's a weapon with built-in training wheels. Couple this with 343 Sandbox lead initially wanting the Commando, not the Battle Rifle, to be Halo Infinite's keystone competitive weapon, and spending much time balancing the game's sandbox around the Commando during development, and you can see why the Battle Rifle perhaps ended up the way that it did. It's not quite as skillfully rewarding to use as BRs of the past. It makes HCS gunfights feel boring to watch in a way that's hard to articulate, and as a weapon pickup, it's far less reliable than the spawn weapon of the game, the assault rifle, which puts up much less of a fight in terms of ease of use and viable ranges. It looks like the battle rifle, but it's sadly not quite what the battle rifle needed as a mechanical comeback. It's a weapon with permanent training wheels that paradoxically wants to be a skillful precision weapon to use and it just doesn't serve the HCS or ranked play in a way that the BR should. A variant of the battle rifle is available in the game called the BR-75 Breacher, which is really just a close-ranged battle rifle with a faster fire rate. 
hardly the most innovative or creative take. The shadow of the commando rifle's development looms over the BR-75, and it left the final product, BR-75, in a rough spot. Couple this with the rather stiff animations and you have a weapon that could use quite a bit of improvement. And improvement is a possibility. With the departure of 343's sandbox lead and his well-intentioned but unfortunate tendency to resist feedback, perhaps discussions can now open up within the competitive scene on how to get the battle rifle into a place where it can truly shine as a competitive starter weapon through changes to its projectile system, recoil system, and other things. This surprisingly wasn't the end of Halo's battle rifle, though. We have one more version to look at. After the release of Halo Reach, Bungie went on to kickstart a new great journey, one they're still riding the success of to this day, the MMO shooter Destiny. Destiny is set in a post-apocalyptic sci-fi world where Earth was graced by a cosmic being from beyond the stars, gifting humanity with the ability to wield primordial forces called the Light. These aren't Spartans, they're Guardians. The Guardians of Humanity, shooting, looting, and carving a new path for the human race to reclaim the stars. Destiny is a first-person shooter like Halo, but one with a very different combat experience. There is no external sandbox in Destiny. There are no weapons to pick up off of enemies. Rather, the player carries with them three weapons at any given time, and they can swap these weapons out for other ones from their inventory. Essentially now, you are the sandbox. Many of the weapons of Destiny fit neatly into categories. Fully automatic auto rifles, close range shotguns, charging fusion rifles, and ranged snipers, just to name a few. And in 2022, Bungie celebrated the 30th anniversary of their studio with a treasure trove of gear, cosmetics, and weapons from their past. And one of these weapons should be instantly familiar. The BXR-55 Battler. The BXR-55 is a pulse rifle, firing three bursts with 36 rounds per magazine, and unlike most weapons in Destiny, damn near perfect accuracy when firing from the hip versus aiming down the sights. The BXR's frame clearly calls back to the weapon Bungie created for Halo 2. Even its view model breaks tradition from other pulse rifles in the game and was repositioned on the screen to better mirror its Halo 2 brother. One of the many perks it can be randomly bundled with are blunt execution rounds, which dramatically increase its damage and handling after a melee attack, referencing the famous BXR if the name of the gun wasn't obvious enough for you. In-game, the BXR is considered one of the best pulse rifles with keyboard and mouse with enough range, accuracy, and speed to carry its weight in ad-clearing but also crucible situations. It's an excellent callback to the weapon's prime, and if reading the description, even Bungie seems to agree. The description reads, A treasured competitive piece from a bygone era. Poetic, don't you think? The history of the battle. Hey everybody, this is Late Night Gaming. I made this really cool outro. It was excellent. I had a pretty snazzy script, something about the battle rifles highs and lows, memes and dreams. There was something about the Halo 5 ADS leaks. It was nice. It was good. It was optimistic. Uh, unfortunately, YouTube finally found the SpongeBob music I've been using, so you're gonna have to deal with my voice for the next about 20 seconds. Yeah, it was a pretty good video, right? I thought so as well. It was pretty hard to edit. Uh, there's the channel members and the Patreon members. You guys are super cool and snazzy. And in about 10-ish seconds, I am going to start answering questions from the Patreon members. Okay, thank you. Bye. Inuyasha Toast asks, What other franchises would you be interested in covering the same as you cover Halo? To be honest, I'm not quite sure. My interests tend to bounce from month to month. There's a lot of games that I actually do really like, and I'd love to make videos on, such as Sonic the Hedgehog, bizarrely enough, Call of Duty, Destiny, hell, even Battlefield. The problem is that my interest is like a revolving door. And there's also that concern about my own audience not really liking videos that aren't Halo. But definitely this year is a year where I think I'm just gonna go with it, and I'm gonna start making videos about other things that interest me. 
If you like the videos, then I'd appreciate you watching them. If not, don't worry, there's more Halo videos on the way. But hopefully this year I can start branching out, much like Hidden Xperia is doing. Robofin asks, any franchise you wish had a video game adaptation or spin-off? Mine is the Stargate franchise, which has been languishing in the MGM archives since 2011. Dude, Stargate is ripe for a video game adaptation. And what's cool about Stargate is you could do anything. You could make it an RTS game, you could make it a first-person game. There's all sorts... God, now my head's spinning. Yeah, Stargate, that's a really good answer. Um, okay. It's hard to say because a lot of, like, the main things I'm thinking, like, movie franchises and stuff, they have gotten video game adaptations, and outside of, you know, the obvious stinkers, some of them have been pretty good. Hell, even Terminator, if I remember right, recently got a fairly decent video game. Which I'd still have to try out, actually. Let's say Blade Runner. Blade Runner as an RPG, as a first-person RPG set in an open-world city would be pretty awesome. I know that's probably a pretty generic answer, but it's the only one I can think of off the top of my head right now. Savart Farmer says, On the topic of games about a green guy who is at his best when he doesn't talk much, you mentioned that Rebecca has gotten you into Zelda. Out of the games you've given a fair shake, which have you enjoyed the most? I would love to see a Zelda video or 10 from you. I love how in-depth you get about a lot of things, and Zelda games have so many little things to go into. Say hi to Bumpus. God, Zelda. Okay. Yeah, Rebecca is super into Zelda, and through her, I've been getting super into Zelda. And I can say it's only getting easier now. The Zelda franchise is pretty cool. If you looked at it from the outside, you could think it has something of an identity crisis, because every single Zelda game is so wildly different from the last. But what's actually creative about Zelda is it takes core tropes, the idea of, okay, there's the princess, you got the bad guy, Ganondorf. You've got the good guy, Link. And it uses those familiar tropes as a grounding mechanism to tell new stories in a variety of different locations. Like, okay, you've got pirates with Link. Cloud adventures with Link. The Legend of Zelda franchise has been pretty awesome so far. Uh, I'm currently chewing through Twilight Princess, Breath of the Wild, and Ocarina of Time, and I'm about to get started on Majora's Mask. And I gotta say, out of all of the ones that I'm enjoying the most right now, it's gotta be Twilight Princess, purely because of the atmosphere and mood. For those of you who have played the game, the Twilight Realm, it's, uh, man, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, so my answer would be Twilight Princess so far. And definitely Legend of Zelda is a series I would like to make a video on, because I have a pretty interesting history with it. So, okay guys, thank you for the questions. Uh, go over to the Patreon. I'd like to interact with you guys a bit more. I know I need to keep up with the Patreon better. Uh, but hopefully this was entertaining for you. Share the video around if you really enjoyed it. Uh, and let me know what weapon you want the next Evolution video to be on. And with that being said, I'll see you guys later. And uh, bye.